So we're now going to look at the completeness axiom and we're going to do a proof um, uh, related to it. So the completeness axiom is kind of weird since it's, it's basically the only axiom we really have to assume um, that's not obvious, you could say. So x plus y being equal to y plus x, that's obvious. This thing here is not. So what does it say? It says if m is a subset of the real numbers, it's non-empty, so it has some point inside of it at least, and it has an upper bound. We're going to explain what that means in a second. Then it has a least upper bound. And you can, if you want, point out that this least upper bound is a real number. Uh, so least upper bound in R. Usually people uh, omit saying this, but it's, it's kind of uh, understood. Um, so what does this mean? So let's just um, visualize this. So let's do an example here. So if you have the real line here, like this, uh, you can put a set here, let's say from two to five, I don't really care. So then this set here has a bunch of upper bounds. So an upper bound is just some number that lies to the right of this set. So let's say uh, 10, 10 is an upper bound. So 10 is upper bound for M since X is smaller than or equal to 10 for all X in M. So that's basically what it means to be an upper bound. If we want to be more or general here, so then we can say that a number U is an upper bound for M if X is smaller than U, um, X is smaller than or equal to U for all X in M. So this is actually the definition of what an upper bound is. So 10 is an upper bound here. What is the least upper bound? Well, you can kind of think of this as a movement. So if I have 10 here and then I push my 10 down here so it goes through, well, every single number here um, continuously, then the, um, the completeness axiom guarantees that since m is non empty, I'll hit it sooner or later. And the first place you kind of stop here or you bump into it, you could say, that is the least upper bound. So here I cannot continue down past five. So five here is going to be the least upper bound for M. And this is what we call the supremum of M, which we denote by sup M. All right. And note here that even though five is not a member of this interval, five is its supremum. And here in this example, we could see that five is the least upper bound and that it exists without using the completeness axiom. So this is not, the completeness axiom is not needed here. Let's do another example here just to, to train our uh, intuition. So if I have the interval from two to infinity, so that's basically taking the real line here, starting at two and never stopping here. This means I can find no number that is to the right of this interval. So it has no upper bounds um, and it doesn't have a least upper bound either. And in this situation, it's common to write that sup m doesn't exist or that sup m is plus infinity. And we can do one more example here. Let's do m to be something slightly more interesting. Let's do this, this set of points here, where n is equal to n star. And I put star here just to throw zero out of, of this set. So I'm taking here the natural numbers, one, two, three, four, etc., because I don't want to divide by zero here. So when I have one here, I have one minus one, so that's zero. One minus a half, that's a half. One minus a third, that's two thirds. One, so one minus a four quarter uh, is three quarters, etc. And you can see these numbers get closer and closer to one. So now you can put here, well, zero, and then a half, and let's put one here, just for show, and then I get three quarters, four fifths, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm getting closer to one here, but I'm never bigger than one. So what we can notice here is that for all X in M, we have X smaller than equal to one. So this means that, so one is upper bound uh, for M. And what does this help me? Well, it means that this, set as an upper bound. We know it's not empty, so it also has a least upper bound. Now, what is this least upper bound? Well, clearly, if you move, well, clearly and clearly, well, if you move a little bit to the left of one, 
you should be bigger than some of the numbers here, right? So I would also say that one is the least upper bound also. Uh, so I can write here, should also be least upper bound. The supremum of M should be one. Let's prove this. So it's a nice exercise. So proof that sup M is one, and it's for this case here. Um, and this will actually be a contradiction proof. So a proof by contradiction. So it's a good exercise. So we already know that one is an upper bound. So to get a contradiction, suppose M has upper bound, so some upper bound T strictly smaller than one. If it doesn't have an upper bound strictly smaller than one, then one has to be the smallest, okay? Then if this is the case, we know that well, one minus one over N uh, is bigger, or that D is bigger than every element of M, which can be described like this for every N in the integers that are non-zero or the natural numbers that are non-zero, okay? So let's now move things around here. Let's solve this for N. So this is the same as if, as if I have uh, this. I know that my D is strictly less than one, so I know that this thing here is positive, so I can divide by it and I can multiply up N. So I get this relation here. What does that mean? Well, it means that I have here found that or every natural number is smaller than this number, but that's absurd because you can get integers that are bigger than any number. That's the Archimedean principle. So this is absurd. It contradicts the Archimedean principle, which we've proven in another video. And we're done.